I'll let Ian introduce himself properly, but in essence, um, if you've never heard of Kirk Schwitters, perhaps you should have done. I don't know much about him, but I've learned a lot as I've been chatting to Ian about setting up this call this morning. And he's a phenomenally important artist that has a wonderful um, place in Cumbrian art history as well. And this year, this July, this month, because it's of course the 1st of July today, is the 75th anniversary of a major event taking place and what's happened since he arrived here. So I'm gonna let Ian talk to us about that. Ian, I've got your slides ready, which I shall share my screen on. And I shall uh, hand over to you now, if you come off mute, to tell us the story of Kurt Schwitters and what's going on. So over to you, Ian. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to Kate and thank you to Tom and, and uh, uh, great to join the network. Um, it is a, a unique uh, Cumbria story. And very briefly, uh, Celia Larner and myself, Ian Hunter, We've been running the Literal Arts Trust for about 30 years, originally based in Manchester. Uh, we did a lot of work in socially engaged art, and we were Manchester City Airports or Manchester International Airports art consultant for 10 years, which enabled us to fund our community and, and uh, other arts development work. However, the Cumbrian part of the story, is, we think is really quite fascinating. It really came out of foot and mouth, um, and we know that was a traumatic event for Cumbria both for its uh, communities and its farmers. And to cut a long story short, uh, the Arts Council uh, head office in London, um, Pauline Tambling, who was head of research, got interested in our work. We were looking at the changes in hill farming, cultural changes in hill farming in the early days of the lottery and persuaded the Arts Council to let us do a, an art project with hill farmers, who, as you know, were socially excluded were and are suffering from suicide and other uh, social and economic exclusion activities. But what really compounded, and Pauline liked that study, and around about 2000 asked us to undertake a longer term study, and then along came foot and mouth. That changed everything. So the Arts Council asked us to produce a report about how maybe the arts and cultural sector could respond to this perception of a crisis in agriculture. And it was very much uh, focused on Cumbria, as you know, around 2001. It was an epidemic, not a pandemic, but in many ways it did resemble a pandemic. It obviously spread to Devon and all over the country. Uh, the government uh, audit office calculated that the nation, during that six month closure of the countryside, lost something like 11 billion pounds in tourism and farm compensation. So the Arts Council at that point said, you know, we need a cultural response to these kind of things. And that's, that was the report that we produced, uh, uh, the first shock. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, thank you, Tom, that's great. And we don't need to um, uh, go over the traumatic impact of it, uh, but the, we, the Arts Council gave us some money, quite a bit of money, to commission artists and writers to document what was going on. Just hold it there, if you don't mind, Tom, on the, on the yellow poster. Um, between 2001 and 2006, we undertake a fairly major study uh, of what happened, uh, mainly during that six months. Uh, we had many Cumbrian artists, and John Darwell, you might know, and people like that, documenting it, writers and poets and musicians, quite an extraordinary process of documentation. And then over the next five years, we gradually sifted through that, had a major conference in Manchester Town Hall called the Cultural Documents of Foot and Mouth. Uh, the question might be why Manchester Town Hall? Of course, uh, policymakers live, and the Arts Council, we all live in the cities. So we thought it was important to take that rural story to the city, not as a negative story, but as a positive story. Uh, how artists and farmers in Cumbria and elsewhere mobilized their creativity to address this quite major social change. Next slide, please, Tom, thanks. Um, out of that, again, I wanted to stress, uh, I'm an artist and Celia, my partner, is, is a writer. We're artists. Go, go back, uh, Tom, just back up to the, the white one. Yeah, just pause with culture and pandemics. Um, and so uh, out of that, we, we also do policy research. We were artists, we run art events, we work with children, uh, we do exhibitions, but we're also, I have a PhD in cultural policy. So the, the Arts Council said to us, look, this is bigger than what we thought it was before. And so we persuaded them to look at this idea of culture and pandemics. Now, this was before COVID-19. Uh, this is the cover of the report that we did in 2011, uh, saying, look, pandemics are going to become a major factor in the future of our, our, our culture. We need to be prepared for that. So we need an art strategy to be prepared for that. 
um, and without going on too much, uh, there was a major conference held in London at the Creek Institute in June 2018. And that uh, 300 scientists and uh, epidemiologists from all over the world and health ministers met in London and they predicted a future major pandemic. That was COVID-19, which came three years later. So what we have here is a conquer policy that would enable people to deal with that. Now, it, it came out of Cumbria. What I'm trying to emphasize here, that experience began in Cumbria. So that's something we're still working on. If you want to know more about it, that's our website there that will tell you more about our rural work uh, and our cultural pandemic work. Like, next slide, please, Tom. I'll try and keep this as brief as I can. What the Arts Council then said to us, uh, just hold it there, Tom. Thank you very much. That's great. What the Arts Council also said at head office was, look, you know, uh, it's not just a case of the rural holding out its hand and saying, give me money, give me money. Uh, they said, look, if we're going to respond to this, we need to have an economic argument. You know how it works with uh, pre Nadine Dory's <laughs> cultural policy in that you have to go to government and make an economic case for support. So we came up with this idea of the creative rural economy. So from 2006 to 2000, and, well, recently, we did several major reports for the Arts Council uh, we like this idea of the future is rural. I mean, Cumbria is largely a rural uh, sector, but sometimes the perception in Whitehall and amongst policymakers, not all people, uh, Arts Council kind of got the message, uh, is that the rural is marginal. The rural is a deficiency model. It's always looking for help. It's, it's got problems. We turned it around and said, no, the future is rural. So two reports there, uh, the new creative rural economies, major report, and then the volume, the second volume uh, appendices, uh, we, we actually looked at the impact of Asian, ethnic minority, minority African refugee communities who are also making a major contribution to the rural economy and rural culture. So the idea was to turn around the, the negative perceptions and make it positive. And of course, the means for that was using arts and cultural project, projects and documentation. Next slide, please, Tom. Thank you. And uh, this is the report that we finished off with. Uh, I wonder if we could get the full image, Tom. Maybe I'm just only just getting a bit of it here. Sorry, uh, you're very helpful, thank you. So we actually, the Arts Council then said, well, actually it was DCMS and DEFRA. At this point, we were working with DEFRA and DCMS. And remember, of course, the shock of 2001, the uh, FMD uh, pandem ep epidemic. Then the, with the world economic shock, and then of course Brexit and then climate change. If you add all of those kind of inverter kind of shocks, uh, cultural policy, we as artists and cultural makers and uh, really have to pay attention to this because it's obviously affecting the way we work. And in a sense, it's presenting us with important intellectual, moral and ethical challenges. I think the Arts Council get it, but the key report was the creative, new creative rural economies, which basically said, look, the rural is generating close to two billion pounds per annum. The creative rural sector, that's dance, theater, music, creative farmers, uh, galleries, and museums, collectively, we had it independently audited and five years ago it was two million so, or two billion. Our report to the Arts Council at DCMS said, listen, give us a bit of money and we can up that to four billion. And that's really where the, the project is positioned right now. So the final slide, Tom, thank you. Uh, is is really is the argument that we presented to DCMS and the Arts Council, um, and again this is independently audi audited by the CBI, the Confederation of British Industries. Uh, several universities have independently audited, and again all we did was look at what was going on in the rural sector from a slightly different perspective and say, how is the creative rural sector contributing to the national economy? Nobody has ever looked at that before. And I'm not saying we are the experts. All we did was gather up available evidence, make a coherent argument and get independent economic agencies to validate it. So uh, what we're saying to the Arts Council and DCMS, give them, as you know, the Arts Council receives about 500 million to 600 million pounds per year from DCMS and government to fund the arts, which is terrific. I mean, that's why our museums are there. We're saying give the rural 1% of that and out of that, it could can mobilize that for, for, for billion. So the key, the last um, two recommendations in the report, equity and arts funding for uh, rural as well as urban creative sector, 
Um, as you know, the urban creative sector is getting uh, several billion uh, to uh, invest. We're getting virtually nothing. And I'm not saying the rural sector isn't getting money from the Arts Council, it is, but it's not been targeted strategically at developing the creative rural economy. It can do and it will do. The sixth point is the most important one. And I think it's where we may differ with the Arts Council who say the rural has a voice. We say the rural sector, and by this I mean farmers, as well as the tourism sector, as well as the art galleries and museums and artists in the rural sector, a tremendous creative potential. Rural women, uh, the rural women in enterprise, the contribution of uh, uh, refugees and ethnic minorities, these are, and, the, and the contribution of the gypsy and Roma community is quite extraordinary. So we're saying we need a more democratic and transparent rural cultural funding policy. It's not that popular with the Arts Council right now, but we keep, we keep boring away. So that's the end of the rural stuff. Uh, Tom, could you switch to the art bars now, please? Thank you. Thanks okay. very much, Tom. I've, I've, I've got a few more minutes, have I? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. We want to hear about um... uh, art barns or yeah. Mr. Schwitters. Okay. <laughs> Here he comes. Good man. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Of course, of course, uh, what, what we're really here to talk about is uh, the importance of Kurt Schwitters in Cumbria's cultural um, life and his contribution to uh, a British art and culture. Again, um, so what's the connection between this and the rural work I've just talked about? In 1999, uh, as you know, when the lottery came in in 97, 98, a huge amount of funding went to the cities. Uh, by, to, by 1999, a government select committee was set up to monitor what was happening to that money. And they were concerned about the failure of some of that funding for large prestigious projects in urban areas. That's their words, not mine. So we went to the Arts Council and said, look, can we use some, use some of this uh, lottery money to help the hill farmers? The initial response was no, no. They said, we don't do agriculture. So we said, well, look, if we come back to you with a precedent, an example, would you, would you be willing to look at it? And to their credit, they said yes. So six weeks later, we came back and said, knocked on the door and said, listen, by the way, Kurt Schwitters made a wonderful art project in a farm barn in Cumbria. And they just sat back and said, okay, we give it, you can apply for some money. That was art barns, which basically we took uh, 15 of the most marginal hill farms in Lancashire. Uh, the farmers' barns were empty because of course, mechanization has changed. And we said to the hill farmers, would you like to have artists come and live with you? Not just visit, but stay with you for five or six weeks, make some art in the barns, and then you can work together and, and plan after. And that was the concept of art barns. Arts Council funded uh, out of the lottery fund. And of course, we acknowledge Kurt Schwitters. So next slide, please. So that was a huge success. We were one of the most successful arts lottery projects that the Arts Council ran in those days. I'm sorry about the degraded quality of the slides. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Alongside that, we ran a conference in Ambleside in 1999 to say, who's Kurt Schwitters? Uh, why did he drop out of the narratives of British uh, art and culture? And it was a fantastic conference. Uh, we thought maybe 30, 40 people would come and add an art newsletter and add an art monthly. Over 300 people came. The Tate sent five curators. There were flying curators in, from Germany. Why Cumbria and Kurt Schwitters was uh, a story waiting to happen. Remember he came as a refugee, penniless. Cumbria made him welcome. The local people in Ambleside supported him. And he was able to begin his last great uh, modern art experiment in this little bar barn in, in, in Langdale. Next slide, please, Tom. And this is an example of some of the barns we worked on. The thing to remember here is in the hill farms, not, not the, the grand farms that you see in Cheshire and places like that. These are little uh, remote hill farms uh, they're barely clinging on. Um, the wives are mostly working as nurses or out of the farm. The farmers are relying on European subsidies. And, you know, it wasn't a good time after fruit and mouth. So that's why we did the project. Uh, so we rented the barns from the farmers. The artists lived on the farms. With, so you have mainly urban artists living with marginal rural communities. And the interesting thing about the hill farmers was they said, you know, People don't understand what's happening to us. Uh, they don't value us. We feel, de we feel marginalized, devalued. We feel that our culture is of no value. And curiously, when you talk to black people and, and, and Asian people in the cities, they say the same thing. Next slide, please. Uh, go, flick on, just uh, go on to the next slide, please. 
So what we did was because we had lots of connections in Manchester with the African community, we brought the African women out of Manchester. They had their own uh, self-help organizations. This is Mamatura Adeniran Pimp. She's a Nigerian uh, woman. She's an, an, an orator, very well known in Manchester. Here she is standing in a farm barn in remote East Lancashire in uh, uh, 1999. And what she's doing, she's been interviewed by Farming Today, which is the BBC radio program, as you know. And what she's saying, Tony Blair was, was the prime minister. She was telling off Tony Blair for not helping the farmers. And she really gave it full whack. And apparently, the, the phone lines in BBC farming today were absolutely red hot with farmers ringing up to congratulate Mama Toro for speaking for British farming. That's how it worked. Next slide, please. And of course, the other beautiful thing about it. So the Art Barns was a kind of what you call an interface project. It allowed several cultures to work together and to share their problems. And this is Mama Toro with um, one of the Hill Farmer wives uh, talking about children. And of course, uh, so it was the women who understood about children and animals and all of that and they hit it off really and they formed an alliance uh, so the um the hill farming family were able to market their milk and and halal slaughtered um uh mutton directly into the city so it was a good economic project as well next slide please almost finished uh, um this is the open because because we had done the farming project and got the money for the hill farmers and the artists to work on. Then we had to, then we decided to switch back to Kurt Schwitters because we owed him a debt. This is uh, October 1999, 24, 23 years ago. We're at the Mertz Barn, which is a complete wreck. Uh, the guy in the, the black rainproof jacket is the owner of the Mertz Barn. He's the grandson. And you see Mama Toro again giving it full whack there. Uh, the German ambassador, various academics celebrating the, the the, the contribution of Kurt Schwitters to Cumbria. Um, and at the end of that meeting, he said to us, listen, I'm going to sell the property you want to buy. It. Next slide, please. So we said, okay, uh, we'll take a look at that. This is John Elderfield, who is deputy director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Where he's standing is in that damp farm barn. Why? In 1970, as a young, he's from Yorkshire, as a young academic in Leeds doing his PhD, he was doing his PhD in Pusa, if you can imagine. He ended up by accident in the Mertz barn, saw the wall that was surviving, Schwitter's wall, completely transformed his life, changed his PhD, wrote his PhD about Kurt Schwitter's 1970-71. Five years later, he got a job at MoMA in New York and he became deputy director. We wrote to him and said, we're going to buy the Mertz barn, could you help us? He said he flew over immediately, stood in the Mertz barn, there he is in Northwest tonight, saying Cumbria and Britain should support the Mertz barn. You, Kurt Schwitter's contribution to international art, to European art, is, is inestimable. And you should be protecting this Mertz Barn. Next slide, please. So anyway, uh, the word gets out and Damien Hurst picks it up. So Damien says, I tell you what, uh, uh, I, I owe Kurt Schwitter's, I'm quoting him now. He said, uh, how much do you need? We said, we need 150,000 pounds to buy the Mertz Barn to save. This is the little farm we are. He says, okay, I'll paint you a spin painting and dedicate it to Kurt Schwitter's. Uh, send it to Sotheby's and tell them uh, you, you're to get 150,000. That's what we got. That bought the Mertz part. And uh, it was quite amazing after that. The whole Cumbria, the Langdale community, all the people in the South Lane got involved. Huge celebration. And we bought the Mertz part. Much to our surprise. Next slide, please. And there we are. We have school projects there. So these, this is the local Langdale school children. So when we told them that Damien Hurst had given us a spin painting, and we showed them the photographs. First thing the kids said was, we can do better than that. <laughs> so, so here are the Langdale school children making, you know, they, they use a, a drill and you put a spin bucket, you chuck paint at it. So here are the children making a Damien Hurst fake. It was, it was a little industry, uh, spin paintings. We sent a couple to Damien Hurst and he wrote back and said, thank you very much. Have you noticed that his spin paintings have got better recently? So, next slide, please. So we have fun. Uh, here we are, this is actually 2007, we're celebrating the purchase of the Mertz Barn. Again, I want to emphasize here, it's just Celia and I, uh, we're two older generation artists, uh, we're self-funded, uh, running this little charity. Yes, we do research work, uh, but we hadn't planned or anticipated buying and owning the Mertz Barn. But how could we say no when the opportunity arose and with all of that generosity? So here's the community celebrating the first day 
of the acquisition. Lots of young artists come here, local people and so on. Next slide, please. I think this is probably the concluding slide. This is what we got when we bought the Merch Park. The property had been neglected for 30 years. It was an absolute mess. So it's taken us five to 10 years with volunteers to clear it up. Next slide, please. Thanks, Tom. I'm almost finished. Uh, this is what we it looked at. The Merch Farm was falling down. Next slide, please. Thanks, Tom. And anyway, we started doing a bit of publicity. So one of those chance occurrences, the phone rang and it was the exhibition organizer from the, v or from the Royal Academy. He said, I've heard about the Merch Barn. I said, terrific. He said, we'd like to have one, please. So I think he's joking. So I say a big one or a small one. He said, don't be impertinent. Uh, we're having an exhibition of British sculpture. Uh, we would like to build the Merch Barn in the full court of the Royal Academy. Next slide, please which is exactly what they did. So these are the local farmers who went down to London, 2011, and they rebuilt Kurt Schmitter's Cumbrian Mankey, but I use that word kind of not pejoratively. They <laughs> rebuilt Kurt Schmitter's Mankey uh, Burst Barn outside the Royal Academy as the centerpiece of 100 years of British sculpture. Final slide, thank you. And now the important thing. We mustn't forget the reason why Kurt Schmitter's came to Cumbria in 1945, as he and many, almost all the other leading uh, modern artists of the 1930s were declared degenerate in Tartakunst by the Nazis. Uh, and they had a major exhibition in Munich in 1937, 19th of July, 1937, where they put all those artworks by famous artists that read like the who's who of modern art. And here's Hitler opening the exhibition, hanging upside down above Hitler's head is a painting by Kurt Schwitter. Next slide, please. And so that's why we have this commemorative event at the Merits Barn, where we uh, uh, remember those artists who were and architects who were persecuted by the Nazis. And that's really the, the basis of this event we're having on the 19th of July at the Merits Barn. And you're all welcome. Thank you. Ian, give us a potted history of Kurt Schwitters. Who was he? Why does he matter? And just remind us the connection with this barn. What was that? So just give us a bit of potted history, sort of three minutes on Kurt Schwitters. Sure, I didn't want to do an art history. Just right. Um, he fled, uh, he fled like uh, they all left Germany in 37. He went to Norway. He ended up in England in 1940, interned in the Isle of Man, spent the war in London, came up to uh, Ambleside with his partner, Edith Thomas, and spent the last few years of his life uh, unknown, uncelebrated painting landscapes and portraits to earn a living. One of the portraits was of a, a farmer called Mr. Pierce, who owned the Merch Barn, who actually owned the land, the little farm where we are now. So Schwitters came out and rented the barn and began working on his last great Merch Barn experiment. What we need to remember, and it's a Cumbrian, it's a major Cumbrian success story. You gave him refuge, Cumbria allowed him in, made him welcome, and we know what's going on today with Ukraine and indeed with other refugees. This is a really important cultural achievement for Cumbria. The fact that the Mertz Barn happened was extraordinary. The other important uh, factor was the museum. Can you imagine the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the apogee of the international art world, commissions and funds an experimental art project in Cumbria in 1947. They stick in $3,000, which is what, 30,000 pounds today, okay? That's how, much, that's how much confidence they had in. That's why the Merit Spine's important. So there it is, it's a great lesson. And of course, it's even more important today when you have the fascists in Ukraine, the Russians destroying the Ukraine. Let me just finish with a quote. And it's a quote from the G7 meeting that was held last week. And it said, this is 1937 all over again. What we're witnessing is the prelude to almost a major World War III. That is so serious. And here's Kurt Schwitters, 1937, saying the same thing. Beware, be prepared. So Cumbria has a unique uh, cultural asset here. Please support it. Thank you, Ian. George, just come off, George Cook, just come off mute, George, and tell us about what's going on at Higham Hall in September to do with Kurt Schwitters. Yes, um, one of our tutors, Elizabeth Fisher, who lives um, between here and Penrith, Anyway, um, she's um, pretty big on um, Schwitters and uh, everything. So she's introduced us to the theme. So she's running a course in September. And I think she's been involved with other 
um, activities elsewhere as well, based on um, Kirchwitters and the uh, the Mertz Barn. Um, so it's uh, interesting, and we we did put together a modern art and location course. Now Elizabeth sort of takes people around interesting places. They don't have to be artists, but we found that um, up here in Cumbria and the borders, there are amazing locations which are virtually unknown from a, for a lot from a lot of people, which have inspired 20th century artists, um, especially um and poets um and so we've sort of started to build a, a set of courses around these themes and, and it just right. happens to be fitting in with what ian was talking about uh, and, uh, and includes a visit to the mertz barn and uh, um various other locations around langdale and ambleside thank you george lovely stuff amy yeah i was um fascinated to find out about this because i've heard a little bit about it but it was great to hear a bit more um and i just wondered what the future sort of holds for the for the mers band because you sort of mentioned that you, um yourself and celia are um you know own the barn and um are kind of the the people who look after it at the moment but i just wondered what's what the sort of future plans for for kind of keeping it um keeping it going keeping it safe that kind of thing do you want me to answer that uh Absolutely, yeah. Oh, sorry, and briefly, thank you very much for that question. Um, we don't own the Merce Barn, it owns us, <laughs> if you know what I mean. We're custodians. Yes, we, if we, as a charity, we legally own it, but we only see ourselves, we're not Schwitter's experts, we want to underline that. For us, it's a, it's a, a cultural responsibility, but we're delighted to share with other colleagues in, in, in Cumbria and so on. Um, two things, the, uh, on the 30th of, I'm sorry it wasn't able to go up on your website, but on the 30th of July, we're opening Chaos 75, that's the 75th anniversary. All of those questions will be answered in the exhibition. That is, you know, we're, how we got to here, what our future plans are. Um, and uh, obviously we'd like a bit of funding to help run the place and that may yet happen, uh, but it's a very positive story. Uh, and it, of course it will continue and, and we will do it. But so come uh, from the 30th of July to the 16th of September, Chaos 75, it'll be on the website tomorrow. Um, you're very welcome. The door, the gates are open. It's free. Tons of parking, and uh, it's a lovely place to come. Okay, so uh, maybe Amy, if you can dig out a link to uh, to that event yeah. that might be on the um, uh, the Mertz Barn website, that would be useful um, to let everybody know about that. Can I can I, can I just ask Kate a, a question? Would that would that be okay? Or maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to. Have enough. So Kate, three it's, minutes. It, what? We got three minutes, Ian. So right, go okay, for it. right. Okay. So, Kate, uh, putting on your museum network hat. Of course, there are aspirations to build a Kurt Schmidt's museum, or not major, but something quite modest uh, on the site. So, there is no Kurt Schmidt's museum anywhere in the world. There are excellent collections: Abbott Hall, Armit, of so on. Uh, we're not talking about collecting uh, original artworks, but it's kind of, and I hate the word interpretation center, but a small, modest Kurt Schmidt's museum on the site would be really great. And as I say, where we're, the exhibition will explain that. But I'd like to talk to you further, Kate, about networking in with your your museum network, okay? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. I'll come along on the 19th and we can do it there and then. Wonderful. Or, or even soon thereafter. Absolutely, it's thank you. It's been fascinating. And you're a little bit of that. And you know, <laughs> Abbott Hall, one of the museums that I spend time in, yes. they have a great Coach Schwitz's uh, collection, but I didn't know I didn't know the thread, if you like, of it. Yes. Fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank it's taken us a while to get to this point, but we're so glad to have um, you know, had you here today. Jaquetta, um, if you want to come off mute, I think you've got a question. No, it's off question. I just wanted to apologize to Ian. I can't come to the event because oh, we got a monthly it. Buddhist meeting that day. So apologies, but hope we'll be able to come out another time. And okay. I hope the event's a great success. I yeah. should say that Jaquetta's nice to hear today. Jaquetta has been with us for almost the whole 15 years. It wouldn't be the same without you, Jaquetta. Thank you. Thanks, Jaquetta. Right, Amy has very kindly put a link into chat. So if you want to find out more about that event on the 19th of July, it's all there. Ian, thank you so much. Uh, thank do you stay with us till the end of the call. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise on this very fascinating German refugee that came to this part of the world and how wonderful that Cumbria was able to welcome him, as I hope it probably did and embrace what he was doing as well. Um, great, a great, a great sort of feather in the Cumbrian cap, I think. 
Thank you, Ian. Right, let's go from Kurt Schwitters to Cockermouth Live. Bit of alliteration there. And uh, Cockermouth Live is an annual festival of great things that take place in, in the West Cumbrian town of Cockermouth. And before we just hear a few minutes from the man behind it all, which is Bob Pritchard, I've got a nice little promotional film. Uh, Kate, I'm, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, we're going we're gonna to share the film first, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So Cockermouth Live uh, is this weekend. I'll just film uh, whilst that film arrives. And Bob is going to tell us all about it in just a moment. It's a whole weekend of good stuff with um, music and drama and all sorts of other arts by local people. Here we go. Awake, awake, you drowsy sleeper. Awake, awake, it's almost day. How can you lie in sleep and slumber And your true love going far away Thank you for that. It's such a sweet little film. First of July, that'll be today. There we have it. Are you there, Bob? Come off mute. Back to yes, it. there we are. Um, yes, it is. It, it, it does kick off today. Um, and what can we expect, Bob? Three days, 14 venues. Um, Churches, shops, cafes, pubs, Wordsworth House, which is free on the day, and and the castle if it doesn't pour with rain. Over four hundred local performers uh, over that weekend. The vast majority of it is concentrated on Saturday, um, but all the performers give their services free. Uh, it's a non-commercial enterprise. We don't have any food shacks or burger vans. Uh, people are encouraged to support the excellent local cafes and pubs and so on in the town. So what, what's actually on the menu? All sorts of music from Baroque to classical, early music, folk, roots, blues, jazz. And this year we have reggae with Miss Chop, um, a reggae DJ who's be in the Moon and Sixpence Cafe, reggae, roots, rockers, rock steady and dub, it says here. Um, <laughs> Then uh, we've also got um, Dave Camlin's Wild Chorus and Sing Out Choirs with the Earth Song installation they've been creating out of Willow Critters uh, with uh, Phil Bradley, the, the Willow uh, artist. And talking of Critters, we have the world premiere of local, com local composer Phil Wood's new work, Imaginary Menagerie in which uh, he has eight mythical creatures depicted. I imagine you're a part of that little group, are you? Tim? I am, in fact, yeah, and it's, it's a really fun piece. So, yeah, yeah. I'm playing my bassoon in that. In fact, I think probably quite a lot of the people on this call are probably in one, one or other of these things that are going on. Um, so, 
So there's loads of music. There's also drama and spoken word. Um, the U3A drama group have got a sketch show called Getting On. Um, we've got Poets Out Loud, so poets are very, very welcome to come and uh, do their stuff in the dining room at Wordsworth House. Um, words Worth Saying, that, that little section is called. Uh, we've also got new writing um, in the form of Wayne Wrights. Uh, see what I did there? Um, <laughs> It's an idea is that people uh, retell their anecdotes and stories linked to climbing the Wainwright Fells um, with, with which we backed with uh, with images of the fells. Um, and uh, we've got Kurgate Youth Theatre. We have uh, two plays based on words with narrative poems, The Two Lucys and Goody and Harry. Um, that's all in charge of Tish, who's also on this call. Um, encouraging young performers is one of the things that we really like to do. So it kicks off traditionally, uh, and we'll do this year in the United Reformed Church with Cockermouth School Ensembles. Um, this year we've actually got uh, a young pianist, Ruvin Mida, who's been performing on the Steinway Grand in the URC. Uh, and guesting with Mike Ames' jazz trio in Shills, uh, we have Jack Moore, the saxophonist, who's been featuring in Cockermouth Live since he was about 10, I think. Um, but uh, he's absolutely brilliant, as indeed is, uh, is, is Mike Ames' jazz. And lovely jazz afternoon in a, in a cafe. Um, and uh, what about on the Sunday, Bob? Uh, the Sunday afternoon, we've got the Papcastle Community Orchestra, uh, which I think there's about 50 of you um, in there, um, with uh, a very mixed uh, eclectic collection of stuff, it says here. Uh, Abba to Bacharach, uh, songs from the shows, music for royal occasions, all that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a very popular programme and uh, they're absolutely brilliant. Um, again, we've been loved working with them um, over quite a long time now. I mean, the, the festival kicked off in 2010 in its current form uh, as, as part of flood recovery in Cockermouth. Um, and uh, we've, we've been supported by all these different um, organisations and individuals uh, who, who um, tried to bring the town alive during that time. And I, I should just mention also visual arts because me, um, Evan West uh, artist Collective have got uh, art in shop windows under their Meander, Meanders programme and um, there's also going to be a family workshop do your own Kandinsky um, squaring the circle it's called so we're going to make hopefully we'll get lots and lots of Kandinsky's to to display by the end of the day great um, we, we need to wrap up, Bob. Right, so that's okay. Any final thoughts on, on what's in track for? Well, uh, it's just, just a really packed programme and we're back. We're really glad to be back in full strength uh, now after a couple of um, less than four years. Um, but it, it's, uh, I think we're, I think it's a, it is a local sort of celebration, but everybody be very welcome. Do make your way to Cockermouth. Exactly that. Brilliant. And let's hope for some sunshine because it's so much better when it all spills out onto the streets. So thanks, Bob. I know it's a monumental effort as ever. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a great weekend. Tom. Thank you, Kate. Why'd you do it, Bob? <laughs> Come off you mute. Tell us why you do it in 20 seconds. What is your motivation? You're on mute, Bob. What's the motivation? I think the motivation really is um, is to celebrate um, the fact that there is in in a town like Cockermouth so much um, talent, enthusiasm, and interest uh, in, in the arts, and to try and showcase it really by in one concentrated day. It does make it quite difficult because people are, tend to be in more than one ensemble, so the timetabling is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> but um, <laughs> 
but we decided we'd concentrate it all in, in one weekend, uh, to get, a, get a critical mass going. So, well, we salute so we you for doing it. We salute you for doing it. And thank you very much from everybody on this call and everybody who's going to enjoy a great weekend in Cockermouth this weekend. Thank you for all that you do, because um, it's an amazing event. And yes, fingers crossed for the weather. And Marion, thank you for putting your detail in chat there as well about other bits and bobs going on at the Kurgate Centre as part of the celebrations. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm just going to ask everybody for a bit of thought now. Um, I don't know whether you are aware, but we just launched a little podcast for the network has launched a podcast. It's called Behind the Scenery, and um, it is about trying to get behind uh, kind of, you know, under the bonnet of the cultural and artistic um, things going on in the county. And I've done a little inaugural introduction promotional podcast, which is about eight minutes long, which you can find on the CACN.co website, or you can find it on Spotify as well. Um, I've got some ideas as to what I think should be on that podcast. Um, and I'm also really interested to hear from anybody else, anything that you think could be a useful regular feature on the podcast, something that we should be doing a bit more of. Um, and I'd be really interested in anyone's thoughts about what could be part of that podcast. The one, the one, the one specific plea I've got to say this morning is I want to start a little um, feature um, uh, called something like the sound of the artistry. And what I want to get from people is the sound of artists or cultural leaders at work. Now, the only correlation I can do to help help you understand what I'm saying is if, if anybody ever listened to Broadcasting House on a Sunday morning on Radio 4, they have a little feature called Slow Radio where they just have the sound of something going on in the country. So it could be the sound of, um, I don't know, uh, uh, ducks quacking on a thing, uh, or it could be the sound of someone cooking bacon and eggs. It doesn't matter. It's a lovely sound. And podcasts are all about sound. So I'd be really interested if you, if you're an artist or a cultural leader, I suspect everybody else, everybody on this call, by the way, is either an artist or a cultural leader. Have a think about what's the sound of your work. Uh, Chris Dennett has already produced something beautiful, which is going to appear on a podcast very soon. Uh, Chris, do you want to just come off mute and just say, what? how did you approach recording the sound of you at work? Well, yeah, I just thought about a day. It's quite nice, actually, because you just sort of focus in on all the, the, the sounds out and about. Now, a lot of the sounds in my day it's me tapping on the keyboard and the radio blaring out but yeah I went through making coffee in the morning taking the dog for the walk which is all it's sort of important parts of my ritual before sort of getting into a creative space and then I happened to be using a pen plotter uh, on that day which is a sort of robot thing and the sound that makes uh, is great and luckily in the other corner of this room is a uh, BBC journalist has a lovely microphone, so she recorded it for me. And especially, I was especially pleased with the dog scampering that down the sort of uh, the road towards me. We got, I think we got a good sort of skittering sound. But uh, yeah, it was quite nice to do. It was, um, and it sort of gets you focused in on all the noises for a while. Sort of uh, makes you think slightly differently about what's going on. The, the sound of copying and pasting code for the internet, though, is doesn't come across very loudly in it. <laughs> so it's amazing what you can record on your phone these days by the way phones have amazing microphones on them. so i'm looking for contributions from you all of the sound of you at work being an artist being a cultural leader uh, doing stuff and probably the more you know kind of um not normal this is not what you expect uh, the better so derek says does test match special count absolutely listening to test match special completely counts uh, George unblocking a sink. I think that's a fine sound. Kate Perry, my head hitting the desk. Mm. That's an excellent sound as well. So all sounds of people at work making artists, making artistry and cultural stuff happen in Cumbria. Um, I, you probably know how to get hold of me. Um, the website, the, the address, that the generic address for this is hello at cacn.co.uk. Uh, but I'm always popping stuff up to Facebook and Twitter, so you can probably find me. So do feel free to contribute sounds of you at work and also any ideas. And if anyone wants to come off mute now and just shout out what might be a nice thing to hear on a podcast as a regular feature or as um, something that we could have a go at, uh, then you're more than welcome. Otherwise, it's all going to come from me, I'm afraid. And my brain has capacity, but it's not necessarily the most creative brain in this group of fine people before me now. I'd like to hear. Um people just talking about taking the idea and 
making something from it, whether it's a curation in a museum and how that's done or an artist sort of just more detail about people making it because we often see the end results, but less of the sort of, yeah, I had this idea, this bit went wrong, this was okay, that side of it, behind the scenes sort of stuff. Yeah, I think I think anything that we can do to get 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 under the, you know, yeah, how did that come about? Where did that start from? How did that idea emerge? Where did you? Where was the cul-de-sac that you didn't go down? I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try and chat to people about that sort of thing. Um, I've done a really interesting interview with uh, <coughs> Carmen Nazra, who is the uh, excuse me. Carmen Nazra is the writer of the climbers on at um, Theatre by the Lake, and her story of how that play actually came about is fascinating you know she started writing it years ago because her brother came back from Kilimanjaro and out of that became an idea for actually what happens when things can go wrong or, or relationships can go wrong on a, on a, on a big walk on a big mountainside um, I've done a nice little recording of one of the young poets at the Kendall Folk Fest at the Kendall Poetry Festivals I think I mentioned um, uh, and other few other bits and bobs as well I'm also trying to get stuff from West Cumbria in particular and also with young people um, it's a real opportunity to cut through, I think, to a slightly different audience with the podcast. Um, so again, if you've got connections or contacts with young people who are doing fantastic stuff in the cultural community, again, I'd love to hear from you because um, I think that's an underserved voice um, and I would love to raise that a bit more. Jane, you got your hand up. Do you want to come off mute? Um, what about Serendipity Corner? So those moments. Just though, it, that was what was lovely this morning about the, uh, the coach fitters those moments when things connect that you couldn't expect, you know, we've all got one. So maybe those tales, you know, of unusual connections that suddenly happen. Great idea, great idea. Gonna try and make that work somehow. Serendipity Corner, it's already got a great title. Marion, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I, I, it really overlaps with what's just been said. I, I really like the idea of cabinets of curiosities. Um, which can be a way of sort of just corralling and curating a random, you know, interesting short bits that sometimes you need for texture in a podcast. Yeah. Do you listen to podcasts, Marion? I do from time to time. I'm not a regular subscriber. But I haven't got enough time. I'd love to if read anyone, and listen more. And If anyone listens to a great podcast and think that's a great podcast, then again, if you could drop me a line, I'd love to listen and find out what makes it great and tell me why you think it's great as well. Natalie, did you have a hand up? I'm still getting to grips with where to find the hand icon. That's not really helpful, is it? <laughs> um, just a thought, but how about openings? So as in the sound of different things opening. So the knock on the door and then the different weights of doors that you can hear. So a fire door, automatic doors, sash windows, because we open our own imagination to be able to step into the realm of creativity. I'd love, would you, I'd love you to do that, Natalie. Why don't you have a go at recording some openings? Okay. Chuck it my way and then we can have a conversation and we can finesse that into something beautiful. It's a great idea. It's a great idea. Openings as opposed to closings. Right, so there's the podcast. It's out there. Um, there's more stuff coming your way. If you if you listen to bits like that, you can obviously listen through the website or through your phone. Um, it's easy to access, and I hope that's something that builds as we go on uh, over the next coming weeks, months, and uh, and time ahead. That is it, I think, for this morning. It's ten twenty six. Unless there's any other business from anyone else that wants to say anything. No, I know there's stuff. There's a big festival in Whitehaven uh, this weekend as well. So if you're sport for choice, it's either Cockermouth or Whitehaven in West Cumbria. Next week, we are going to be at Florence um, Mine, Florence Art Mine, um, because they've got some great new stuff starting there, um, a new exhibition opening there. Um, and all sorts of other bits and bobs as well. So that is the plan for, for next week. Um, so again, a bit more West Cumbria, but if, if any if any time you want to come up with an idea for something that we should be talking about, celebrating, championing, networking, sharing, don't forget to have September the 16th in your diary as well, which is part two of the quarterly meeting, which we started last week um, about uh, relevance and uh, inclusivity which uh, we're going to look at um, and there's, there's actually we've got ambitions to get some stuff to do at Rose Hill on the 16th of September as well so it's not just going to be sitting in a room listening to people there's actually going to be stuff to do so that's cooking up very nicely too thank you very much for your time this morning lovely to hear from Ian 
and uh, the, the Kirch Fitters story and all the background to that as well. And good luck, Bob, and all those taking part in Cockermouth Live. May you hit the right notes, play the right strings, and may the rain stay away. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for your time this morning. Catch you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Head west this weekend. It's where it's at.